and then PH43A working on geometallurgy. And uh, one of the easy things to do which is relevant to geometallurgy is calculated mineralogy. So I was going to introduce you to that concept and see if this will work. So it's a big project. It runs between JKMRC in Brisbane and the, and the CSIRO in Perth and at, at Hobart. So it's been running for seven years. And this phase, PA43A, will finish in June. The idea is that geologists should talk to metallurgists more. And if they did, then the metallurgists might tell them what they want to know. And then the geologists might be actually able to measure it. And the idea would be that, that we would be able to measure some things that are actually relevant to processing performance. And that if we found the right things, we can measure them perhaps even on every assay it would be really nice. That would be the optimum to actually have something that told you about recovery and commutation rates at a two minute interval or whatever your assay is. Well, maybe we won't get that, but the idea would be at least we can tell variability. If we can tell variability, then we might be able to tell metallurgists what the domains of difference are before they take their big samples to do their major metallurgy tests, rather than take them all from one place in the mine and finding it only represents 30% of the ore, which is always a problem. Year five, and they suddenly say, what's this stuff you're sending us? This is not what we built the mill for. Anyway, if you did that, then you could use the metallurgy test to calibrate your proxies and, and maybe produce what the geostatisticians, statisticians want to call transfer functions. They want us to provide them with functions which would say if it's got this chloride content and that um, uh, because hardness or some other proxy it'll come out with a, a throughput of 800 tonnes per hour and they can then use that in the planning and optimisation to decide what things should be blended with what. That's a big aim and, and all that end of it is the Mind planning and optimization is something that's happening with CRC or it's not part of this project. Although originally we thought we might do something in that area. There's a lot of mine companies involved. I'll just summarize them here. Um, right, why bulk mineralogy? Why would you want to know about bulk mineralogy? The problem we have is that we routinely measure the elemental analysis. We routinely do the assays, but what the Mets want is the mineralogy. If you want to know about what's happening in the processing performance, it's the minerality that controls how hard it is. It's the minerality that controls what might mess up their flotation system. It's the minerality that controls things like liberation. It's not what the percentage of, of silica is or the percentage of potassium. It's going to be the percentage of the minerals. So on one hand, what we're measuring everywhere is assays and we use essentially one element to do the grade, and we throw all the rest away. If we could convert it into mineralogy, maybe we could get more value, more value out of it. For example, you know, this is this is the question the question we put to Dee Bradshaw was: What do the Mets want to know about the clay content that they get? You know, it's not something that I teach 
my geology students, and it's not something I had any idea of, but when she put that out to a MET discussion group, it turns out they want to know if the cement tank gets over 5%, or the kaolite gets over 10%, if the like gets over 5%, if all the micas, biotype, muscolite, get over 30%, then that starts to become a MET issue. Right? So the geologist should be telling them if this is going to happen, but how does the geologist know that? That the average grade of, of the blended material coming into the mill is going to surpass those critical values. Well, they might know that if they've got a, some estimate of mineralogy of every part of the mine. So, how do we get bulk mineralogy? Well, this is the way people have done bulk mineralogy in the past. Way back when I was a student, and probably you all remember, we did point counting. We had a little stage, and you'd press a button, and the stage would move one micron, or 100 microns, or 1,000 microns along, and you'd look down the microscope, and you say, that's quartz, and you press a button, and it would record quartz, and it would move on another 1,000 <coughs> microns, and you press a button, and about 200 spots was enough to drive you crazy. That's not going to work. Nowadays, point counting is done on scanning electron microscopes using the EDS detector, and that will normally do 10,000, 20,000 points in an hour, something like that. And, and that works down to about 0.1%. So it's very good at 0.1 to 1%. I mean, it's obviously very good at 20% as well, but it turns out that this is going to cost $300 a sample or something. It's going to be too expensive to roll out at the assay interval. So it's the best we have at the moment for a, a quick analysis at low level. If we know that the minerals are interested in up around 5% or 10% or 20%, then we can use XRD. XRD is fairly robust when we're talking about the major minerals, which might be relevant to the combination behaviour, but probably not telling you so much about the recovery. It's not many mines that have valuable phases up at that sort of level. So what do we want from GMS? We want some way to get the mineralogy that's rapid, that doesn't cost much. And the obvious thing that's happened in recent times is that Many people have gone multi-element assays. They don't just do five elements anymore. So if the multi-element assays are being collected anyway, can we do something about calculating mineralogy? Basically, there's two methods that we've been working with recently. Some of you asked me about MinSkew, which is a least squares method that's set up to do single uh, rocks at a time. One of the problems with something like that is if you have 14 elements then you can only do about a dozen minerals because you've got a least squares method the minerals must be less than the constraints and the constraints of those 14 elements. These two methods overcomes that to some extent. Linear programming. Linear programming is widespread in, in um, commercial use for ways to estimate um, any, anything that's positive how many, how many shells you need to a tank or anything like this and how many tank shells would you have left over afterwards, any, any real world quality, quantity. So it's a very well established long term programming. Linear programming itself is actually an algorithm, it's not program, but anyway. The thing about it is you have to come up with some probability factors. Now if, if you knew your rocks were thermodynamically in equilibrium, we could actually use, use Gibbs free energy. So one of the main ways for calculating mineralogy at equilibrium is actually using linear programming. And as a probability fact, as you say you want to minimize the Gibbs free energy of the whole phase. So that would be easy if only rocks were at equilibrium. Unfortunately, most of the rocks we've got aren't at equilibrium. So we have some factors we have to guess. Are they five or are they more? Are they minus 50? Which are the likely minerals, which are the unlikely minerals? So you need some sort of trading set, and usually we've said if you want to do a couple of thousand rocks, we should have 200 XRD analyses to set up some training set to get the factors in here. But once we've got the factors, you can roll this out to 10,000, 20,000 analyses, as we did in some of these programs. 20,000 analyses for linear program takes your average desktop a couple of hours. One of the problems is, if you have mixed disequilibrium assemblages, you can get completely the wrong answer. 
So you've got a whole lot of high grade rocks all at equilibrium at 650 degrees or something. And in the middle of it, you've got a chlorite sericide alteration zone, but you've set this up with factors that are going to try and interpret that assemblage as garnet, biotite, plagioclase. So it can just be completely wrong. You need to be looking at the possibility that there's some other things going on. Perhaps separating the samples into groups about what's been logged as low temperature alteration assemblages and what's been logged as high temperature assemblages and they get run separately. One of the least squares methods takes a different view. It's an extension of the least squares methods we've used before, but says we know some extra about the minerals in this. In the best situation that we've got, we might have also done XRD on the same samples. So we'd have an estimate, especially for the major minerals, and we might have an estimate of perhaps 20 minerals by QXRD. Now, they have different error characteristics. XRD's got a much higher detection limit, it's much more robust, but its accuracy is not as good. Something like infrared, many people do high logger down the hole. High logger means that they've got estimates, perhaps relatively poor estimates, but they've got estimates of half a dozen hydrous minerals. <coughs> That's extra constraints. And if you've got those extra constraints, you can use a weighted least squares method to actually use the two sets of constraints together and get your best guess. Some mines actually have visual estimates of mineralogy. They may not be very good estimates, but at least they're going to overcome this problem that you're going to think it's a high temperature biota assemblage and it's actually a chloride sericide. Your visual estimates will avoid those sort of problems. The, the analysis will force you into the right sort of numbers for the analysis. So it's a way to integrate. We do two different sets of data, or multiple sets of data. So that makes it more robust. If you've got some extra data, So we need, some, we need some major element data, we need some minerals, we have to know what sort of minerals they might be, and, and for some of these, like quartz, obviously pure, it's easy to get the composition, but some of them might biotite, you may have to actually go and analyse your biotites on your prospect to get the right numbers, rather than being able to use biotite out of deer how it exists, it depends on how robust you want to be. Here's an example where we had both very high quality point counting. So we used an XMOD in MLA, which is a SEM EDS point counting, 20,000 points. So we knew what the answer should be. We had assay data and we had QXRD. Now, when we looked at the QXRD data against this point counting, Chuck Pyrite was really good from XRD. And Born Up was sort of okay. But chalcosite was absolutely abysmal. One of the problems with chalcosite, of course, is it's not just one mineral, it's a mixture of minerals. And that means instead of having 2% chalcosite, it's got 0.5% of this and 0.2% of that and 0.2% of geoliite or whatever these other minerals are. And each one has different XRD peaks. So that makes it a real bad target for XRD. So Here's some examples where we just put the point counting against the XRD, the blue is the chunk of pyrite, and the line the blue is pretty good. And the boronite's green, you can see they're sort of going off in the right direction, but there's an awful lot of bad ones down here. And then the, the red is the chalcosite, and really the relationship between the chalcosite measured by point counting and the chalcosite measured by QXRD is not very good. It's like throwing darts. If you actually ran them together through a weighted least squares analysis, you could take that pattern and turn it into this pattern. So we've certainly tightened it up a lot for very little effort. Now, in this particular deposit, it turned out it was well behaved, and on the sample interval, these are all the two metre sample intervals, assay intervals, on that range, you did tend to get equilibrium assemblages, so you've got the chocopyrite or the boronite, and the boronite could be with chalcopyrite or it could be with chalcosite, but you didn't get chalcosite with chalcopyrite. So you could use copper sulfur and copper value to calculate what they are. If you did that and put them in, you could get a slightly better result. That is really a linear program approach. And, and we go on and refine it by looking at the other minerals by using the QXRD and, and using the linear 
programming approach to get a first estimate of, of the chart site and then putting it into a weighted model. So you can get your sophisticated. Okay, assuming we can get some bulk mineralogy, what could we use it for? Well, we could just use it to calculate the mineralogy, but we could also say, can we relate the recovery or the comminution with that mineralogy? And in this first case, there was a good, good relationship between the recovery and some of the minerals. So you could produce one of these transfer functions. Oops. So a reasonable correlation between what was measured as batch flow copper recovery versus predicted copper recovery with relationship with the percentage of hematite, muscovite. And that could then be rolled out into a, a whole deposit scale. So showing that there'd be areas of good recovery down here and there's some areas, some areas up here that are going to have very poor copper recovery. Now these are only predictions and they're only as good as the data you put in to do the regression, but at least you've got a prediction that says that maybe you should think very seriously that, that uh, these rocks up here are not going to be economic. It's not just great, but recovery is going to control the economics. Another thing that bulk mineralogy is likely to control, especially in something like porphyry, is, is the rate is going to go through crushing and grinding. We have all sorts of behaviour in crushing and grinding, but the maximum strength a rock can have is based on its mineralogy. You can't be stronger than the minerals you make it out of. And so, if it's a very hard ore, it's likely to be very close to its mineralogical limit, and you should find very good relationships between mineralogy and throughput. If it's a very soft ore, often there's something else controlling the strength. Maybe it's microfracture or porosity, and you're nowhere near the limit of the minerals, so you can't really expect to get very good control on your throughput from the minerality. It depends on what sort of mine you've got. So in this case we calculated the minerality from assay using linear programming. This was done with a four acid digest, so we didn't have silica, 30 elements or something. We had a couple of hundred QXRD analyses to allow us to set up the factors that we needed and then we can put those into various regressions. Now within the gem there's been a tendency to start with principal component analysis, have a look at the ore breaks up into various different classes. Often when you try to model the whole deposit, especially these super big deposits, if you try to model the whole thing together, things don't work that well. But if you break it up into some groups, then you may find some useful relationships. So in this particular one, um, which is a porphyry, a gold porphyry, the soft rocks were high in feldspar and junk fire and pyro, the hard rocks are high in magnetite and albite. There was some other data that was being collected on the same material. Uh, the density and the active hardness seemed to relate to the, the throughput. <coughs> so it was possible then to calculate some throughput relationships based on a, a class separation. So this is the principal component analysis suggesting that maybe you should usefully break this up into seven classes and do the, the you know, transfer function or regression equations for each of these and get some reasonably good relationships between the mineralogy and, the, and things like the bond work index and the AB, which could be built into a throughput model. And that throughput model was then taken back into Leapfrog and produced these sorts of 3D models of where the hard and soft parts of the deposit would be. At this point, we've not yet into the case of actually putting those into a mine plan environment. That's the sort of thing the CRC or is doing, which, which blocks would move in or out of the resource because of their hardness and which ones should be mined first or second because of blending response curves. But at least we're starting to get into a 3D environment with the sort of data we've got. And that's built on 20,000 assays, which have been, had mineralogy calculated from them from a trading set of a few hundred QXODs.
and into the pit that looks something like that. Um, obviously, you don't want these low throughputs up here, so not only is that a bad recovery, but it's also a very bad throughput. And so those rocks should stay right where they are. Okay, so the idea is that we can calculate mineralogy from assay. It'll improve our estimates of the mineralogy. Often the mineralogy itself helps predict recovery variations, possibly because of problem areas like clays, or there's a lot of minerals that potentially will influence or, or that the met metallurgists would want to know about if they were changing in their feed. And, oops, and for, especially for harder rocks, then we can expect that the combination performance, the throughput is likely to be a, a function of mineralogy. It helps to have a full assay suite. It helps to do it on every assay interval, but We'll certainly be able to do this with four assay multi element ass four acid multi element assays which don't have silica, which don't have carbon, and we'll have all the other associated problems with the error behaviour of those sorts of assays. So these may not be the best assays, the resulting calculated mineralogy may not be the best mineralogy, but it's a lot better than you or I can do at guessing the mineralogy from looking at a table of potassium contents and aluminium contents and whatever. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? Really it's much more relevant to bulk mining perhaps than some of the things that happen around here but most of it, most of what we are doing are a big, big volume where things like throughput and recovery, small variations of throughput and recovery can make huge differences to the, to the value of what's possible. We have an anonymous student doing some work, an anonymous project this year, and there's a lot of elements in common what's from there. Now, the old volume of geochem, high volume analyses, all of the geochem, microcodulate and petrology. Just what you've shown up there, there are some aspects we probably missed out on. I didn't realise that the thing could be as far reaching as it is. I think it's probably a really good idea if I were there to talk to you before the project is scoped out in its entirety. Yeah, well, if, the thing is, if you want to be able to correlate it to any of these other parameters, you've got to have some, some materials that are actually going through the other test procedure. Yes. You need to be looking at materials which are in the metallurgical testing cycle. In some way. Well, we're not looking at so much from the metal export point of view. Um, it's like at this stage, yeah. 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 One of the, uh, the points that I picked up was uh, you said that intelligence always say we don't get enough uh, data at the beginning. That's, you know, that's a chronology problem we have because you only draw what you've got available and something you draw deeper. Um, and I think one thing that you showed up there, which had the line schedule, is if you could generate that into a chronology because we don't obviously provide bulk samples to the mill, it's always localised samples. Yes. So they're variations within a range of end members. And that's probably the one thing that, that is really valuable from studies like this. So what, are, what are those end members? So you desire the mill to be able to cope with those two end members. One of these areas had ore that was 40% mica and other ore which was 5%. If they started feeding their mill with a 40% micro only, then they would see big drops in their performance because it would just muck up all their flotation cells, the viscosity, slimes, whatever. Whether that would actually happen in the normal processing is a difficult thing. The chances that you would end up with all those going through at one time may only be small, but when it does, somebody's going to be very unhappy. In the 10 years that they're mining, there might only be one week when only that ore goes through the mill. But if you knew that there was a problem, there wouldn't be a week like that. It never happened. Because you, you would do your timetable in such a way that that never happened. Now, that meant that when we did our small-scale flotation tests, we saw 10% drop in recovery in those high mica samples. Right? So, but the problem then is that they're not really relevant to what happens in the mill because they never pass that, they hope they never pass that 30% threshold for micas. 
but because of that, they've said, well, actually, we don't need to measure silver going in our feed, we'll measure aluminium instead, because that's a good proxy for the, for the muscovite. So I get some warning if, um, if it does start to approach those levels. During this conference, they'll be judging on finalists for our health and safety innovation award. Um, the judging will be done by a panel of four people, and the Ozone Members Health and Safety Committee would like volunteers, um, or that they'd like Ozone mem members as volunteers. Um, the judges will be required to review written submissions from the nine finalists, and also attend a three hour presentation by the finalists. So, um, if any of you is interested in becoming a Judge, a volunteer judge for um, for the um, Health and Safety Innovation Award. Please um, come see me or Andrew Jam up afterwards. Um, the next technical session is um, on the 26th of March, and um, by uh, Professor David Craw from um, University of Otago. And um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.